a train uh, exit from uh, um, slide show. Just exit from slide show and present. Okay. That is better. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, good. Um, our patient is a GN, a female, sixty-three. So history of presenting illness, GN is a 63-year-old female with no known chronic illnesses, presented with a 10-month history of inability to walk, and uh, four-month uh, history of left limb swelling, cough, and weight loss. The patient reports that one day in August 2021, while walking, she had a sound like cracking of a bone around her left hip, accompanied by severe pain, and that she felt like uh, her upper left thigh had separated from her hip in quotes. On attempting to walk, she found that uh, she could not at all support herself on her left limb, as she felt unstable on trying to use the limb, but no associated pain at rest. She then resorted to using a stick aid to help her move around and took painkillers for the pain. The left limb swelling began seven months later, starting from the left hip, uh, progressively descending to involve uh, the whole limb. She reports that she slept well the previous night only to wake up not being able to move her limb. It was associated with severe tenderness, hotness of the limb, shining of the overlying skin and a tingling sensation. She reports no history of bilateral uh, involvement, low back pain, weakness, trauma, uh, or uh, bladder or bowel incontinence. There is no history of a prior unexplained fracture, no history of prolonged steroid use, patient takes normal uh, balanced diet. Uh, the patient reports that she drastically started losing weight as she noted losing of her cloth, but cannot quantify the amount lost. Associated with a loss of appetite and, move and vomiting that was non-projectile, not preceded by retching, postprandial, non-bilas, non-bloody, and of food content. There was also no history of night sweat or evening rise in body temperature. There was no associated abdominal pain, diarrhea, change in bowel habit, or yellowness of the eyes. There was no associated history of recurrent upper respiratory tract infections uh, or bleeding uh, tenderness, uh, tendencies. Patient also reports a history of dry cough days following the swelling of the limb, not blood stained, persistent, of long duration that induced vomiting and not relieved by cough syrup. There was no dental variation, no wheeze, no chest pain, no difficulty in breathing, no uh, running nose, no sore throat, no fevers. She, however, has a positive history of exertional dyspnea with mild pal palpitations, not associated with PND or orthopnea. She has no prior treatment of, uh, she has no history of prior treatment for TB. The patient is currently complaining of severe low back pain and anterior chest pain. On the past medical history, she has no known food or drug allergies, no history of previous surgery or fractures, no history of blood transfusion, no known chronic illnesses. Fa on family and social history, she currently lives with her sons, alive, they're all alive and well. The husband died in a road traffic accident. She has an active NHIF, no history of similar illness in the family, no history of smoking or alcohol uh, use. On her OBSGAN history, she's postmenopausal, para 5, gra gravida 5, uh, normal pervaginal delivery. She had no abortions or no miscarriages. No uh, complications in pregnancy. She had her manic at, uh, at 16 uh, years of age. Uh, she had regular menses. She had no uh, periods of amenorrhea. So on review of systems, her CNS was unremarkable. Uh, in cardiovascular system, there was exertional dyspnea with, with mild palpitations. On genitourinary, it was unremarkable. Um, however, something of note is she's now on diapers due to immobility. Summary, I'm presenting GN, a 63-year-old female with no known chronic illnesses, uh, presented uh, a ten, with a 10-month history of, uh, okay, I did not correct this. I was supposed to correct this, sorry. So she's presenting with a 10-month history of uh, inability to walk and four months history of left limb swelling, cough and weight loss, um, a positive history of associated mild exertional dyspnea with palpitations. She has a negative history of bilateral involvement, weakness, trauma, uh, bladder or bowel incontinence. She has a prior, uh, she has no prior history of unexplained fracture or serial use. Family history, there's also no family history of a similar presentation. On general examination, I found an old African lady lying on a right lateral liquidus position in bed, sick looking, wasted, thinning of, uh, with thinning of hair, oriented in time, uh, place and person, not in respiratory distress. Patient had uh, bandages rolled over her left upper thigh and put on the apples. Uh, on the vitals, her blood pressures were 87 over 64, pulse rate of 97. They were regular normal volume, uh, symmetrical, respiratory rate of 14, temperatures at 36, and SP2 was not measured. 
um, on uh, jaundice, anemia, cyanosis, clubbing, and lymphadenopathy and dehydration were uh, negative, but he had pedal edema up to the ankle on the left limb. On systemic examination, cardiovascular, ex on cardiovascular examination, it was uh, symmetrical on inspection, chest moving with respiration, no more active precordium, no scars, no devices in situ, no more JVP, Palpation, the apex beat was palpable in mid uh, fifth intercostal space, mid clavicular line, no heaves and no thrills. On auscultation, S1, S2 was hard. However, I was questioning uh, whether there was presence of a uh, TR mama uh, and also right sided uh, basal crepitations. Um, respiratory examination on inspection, symmetrical moving with uh, respiration, no surgical scars, no deformity. On palpation, the trachea was central uh, with a normal uh, vocal fremitors. Percussion, uh, it was resonant bilaterally. Oscillation, good bilateral air entry. But however, I was also querying uh, presence of basal crepitations, I suspected. On CNS, GCS of 15, there are no focal deficits. Sensory uh, function was intact. All the cranial nerves are also intact. Musculoskeletal examination, there was wasting of the muscles, tenderness over the left limb, low back, uh, and uh, the left lower ribs. There was also shortening of the left limb. So my impressions were uh, compression fracture secondary to postmenopausal osteoporosis. Uh, another was a pathological fracture secondary to a bone metastasis. I was also questioning bone tumor and DVT as a complication. Should I uh, continue? We finish. We discuss, or at this point, we want to hear from Dr. Fatman, Dr. Suleiman. Hello. I don't Hello. know how do you usually do this. It's my first time to join you in this uh, grand run, so I'm not sure how you usually um, organize it. I think he can continue and finish, and we'll uh, invite any questions at the end once you complete the case. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Doc. So, uh, so far, investigations that have been done are the following. Um, abdominal uh, pelvic x-ray was done, which showed a left displaced uh, shaft femur fracture with multiple lytic lesions. Uh, complete blood count was also done. HB showed uh, um, was at, it was low at 6.5, uh, MCV of 88 and uh, MCH of 27. Uh, generally interpreted as normocytic normochromic anemia. White blood cells were at 16.94, uh, showed leukocytosis. Uh, UECs, urea at uh, 10, it was high, creatinine at 295 being high, renal function, EGFR was at 38, calcium levels were 12.3, phosphate levels at 1.08, liver function test, AST was 142, which was high, ALT was 64, which was high, ALP was at 351 also, which was high. Se on, uh, serum protein e electrophoresis was also done, the, it showed no uh, uh, M component, um, the uh, total uh, AG ratio was 1.21, with the total protein being at 52.8 grams per deciliter. During protein electrophoresis, it showed the positive Benz Jones protein, uh, positive monoclonal band, that type uh, free kappa light chain. Triple serology was negative. A Doppler ultrasound was done, which showed left lower, uh, lower uh, limb DVT. Uh, a bone marrow aspirate was also done, which showed 40% plasma cytosis. Tumor marker were also uh, taken, which showed uh, elevated CA125 CA at 60.5 uh, units per ml. So these are just uh, diagrams. Um, uh, photos I've taken from the x ray. You can see our patient had an x ray done of the femur. You can see the fracture, um, which is displaced. And you can also see um, the lytic lesions on the femur and also on the right uh, femur also. So here is uh, the result for the serum protein electrophoresis, which is very important uh, for this particular case. Um, uh, an M component was not present clearly uh, because you can see the gamma is not as elevated as, uh, is not uh, as we'll expect it to be. Usually we have an M, what you call an M spike, where you have, um, you see the way we have an elevated albumin levels, 
if uh, we have a presence of an M component or an M spike, we'll also have that uh, going as high as uh, the one in albumin. So you, uh, the total protein was at 52.8 and the AG ratio being 121. So thank you. That is for the case. Uh, thank you, Jamal, for the presentation. Uh, before we, we we let over, we we allow Dr. Fatma and Dr. Suleiman to take over. Anybody from the audience who has questions for concerning the presentation, you can type them in the chat box. Jamal, just go back to your investigations. Um, yeah, so when was this uh, test done? The CBC calcium, it these are from 7A. So these were on admission? Yes. And that's the, the, the calcium you got in the file? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's good when you present, you indicate the dates of when they were done. Um, so that we can know uh, how far along these these results are, because I think the latest calcium is two point eight eight, not twelve. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, any questions or clarifications? Uh, there are no questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, I I think we can continue. Okay. So I had started on this, but I'll just uh, recap and then go through. So we said multiple myeloma is part of uh, what we call plasma cell, falls under what we call plasma cell dyscrasias. They're also known as monoclonal gammopathies, paraproteinemias or uh, dysproteinemias. Uh, these are uh, monoclonal neoplasms that are related to each other by the virtue of being uh, common progenitors in the late uh, B lymphocyte lineage. So multiple myeloma is the most common malignant plasma cell dyscrasia. Other common ones include monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, while this forms macroglobulinemia and the primary light chain amyloidosis. So here is a diagram showing uh, um, the lineages and how we actually get to uh, finally get our uh, blood product. Uh, for example, on the, we have a blood stem cell giving us a myeloid and lymphoid series. The myeloid series gives us the red blood cells and the platelets and also the granulocytes. The lymphoid stem cells uh, are giving us the lymphocytes majorly. So uh, we have uh, B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, and natural killer cells from the lymphoblasts. So today we are going to focus on uh, the lineage uh, going to B lymphocyte and production of plasma cells. So we have a B lymphocyte being acti uh, activated by an antigen, and then it matures into what we call a plasma cell, which is uh, what we are going to be discussing. Plasma cells uh, normally they serve as a function of producing uh, antibodies, which are uh, you know uh, produced against certain infections or antigens. So in multiple myeloma, we have uh, abnormal production of uh, plasma cells in high amounts that are uh, uh, not functional. So we have uh, what you call a dyscrasia, plasma cell dyscrasia, which means production of abnormal uh, plasma cells which are not functional. In the end, they are giving you uh, IgGs and IgMs that are actually not serving the, the purpose they're supposed to. So these myeloma cells that are produced, whatever is produced as, a, as an abnormal plasma cell is called a myeloma cell. So these plasma cells, uh, the myeloma cells travel through the bloodstream and they collect in the bone marrow. There they cause permanent damage to health tissue. Uh, as, they, as they are growing, they invade the, high, uh, the outer part of the bone, which is the solid tissue. So they spread to cavities of all the large bones. They form multiple small lesions. That's why it's known as a multiple myeloma. So here we have a, just an, a diagram of the anatomy of a, an a immunoglobulin. We usually have heavy chains and light chain, and also it has a constant region. So we have five heavy chain isotopes just for as a revision, M, G, A, D, and E, and two light chain isotopes being Kappa and Lambda. 
So briefly, the, uh, we are going to talk about the role of electrophoresis in, diagnosis pl in diagnosing plasma cell dyscrasias. So um, electrophoresis basically is, uh, um, it allows, it permits for separation of the components of the serum proteins. We have many proteins in, in, in uh, the serum. We have albumin, we have globulin, we have uh, uh, many proteins, yeah? So what it allows us is to separate these components of the serum proteins, yeah? Uh, in, in by using electric electric uh, electric field, so um, we there's a usually a sharp uh, spike in the region called an M component, which we saw in our, our results from our patient, the SPE. Um, the, the monoclonal antibodies they have to be present at at least uh, more than five gram per, uh, per liter uh, or 0 0.5 gram per deciliter to be accurately quantitated by this method. So we have uh, another thing called immunoelectrophoresis, which reveals whether this is a single heavy or a light chain type. So with the combination of immunoelectrophoresis and electrophoresis, we get a quantitative and a qualitative assessment of the M component. So on the left, we have uh, the normal um, you know, protein electrophoresis. And on the right, we have an abnormal monoclonal protein, as we had said. You see on the left, we have a, a spike only on the albumin. On the right, we have albumin and also on the gamma. Uh, chains. So that is a characteristic of what you call uh, the M spike in myeloma. Okay, so if we might go to myeloma, uh, it represents a malignant pro proliferation of the plasma cell. Um, the tumor, the products of the tumor and the host response to it gives us what we are having as uh, the symptoms or the organ dysfunctions. So as just a way to remember, we have uh, an mnemonic called CRAB of um, related to multiple myeloma, which is a C standing for calcium, elevated calcium levels, R meaning uh, renal impairment, A anemia, and bony lesions. So those are like the most common, the threat rate of multiple myeloma. But we also have other uncommon or less common uh, symptoms, such as close, uh, clotting abnormalities, giving us bleeding tendencies, neurological symptoms that may arise from uh, pathological fractures and compression, and also manifestations of hyperviscosity. So the etiology is not clearly known, but uh, there are a few theories around them. Uh, for example, it has been said that uh, it's, 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 it has been seen more commonly among farmers, woodworkers, leather workers, and those exposed to petroleum products. So up, um, as you can see, also there are some uh, suggested, or uh, there are some a variety of cro uh, chromosomal alterations that have been found in patients who have myeloma, and I've listed them down there. Maybe if you're more, much interested, you can uh, have a keen look at that. So the incidence and prevalence of multiple myeloma, it's estimated that 30,000 new cases of myeloma were diagnosed in 2017 and 12,590 people died from that only uh, just in the US. So it's, a, it's a also a disease that uh, comes with age. Uh, the median age is uh, at 69. It's very uncommon to see multiple myeloma under the age of 40. So it's, we can say it's an age, uh, a disease that comes with aging. Also on the gender aspect, males are more commonly affected than females and blacks uh, in terms of breasts have nearly twice the incidence of whites. So the pathogenesis of multiple myeloma, the proliferation and the survival of the myelo uh, myeloma cells are dependent on what we call uh, cytokines, but most notably is a cytokine called interleukin-6. It's a very important uh, growth factor for the plasma cells. It's produced by the tumor cells themselves and also by the resident st uh, stromal cells. So high serum levels of interleukin-6 are seen in patients with active disease, and it's also associated with a poor uh, prognosis. So this is just a diagram showing how exactly at the cellular level, uh, how we have an interaction between the myeloma cells, uh, the stromal cells, and the effect uh, that the interleukins and the cytokines have. But most notably, it is important to have a general understanding of that uh, by the end of the day, whatever the interaction between the myeloma cells and the stromal cells and also the interleukins are going to give us what you call osteoclastic activity and uh, degradation of the bone matrix. So you can see this is our final product. This is the bone matrix. These are the osteocl osteoclasts that are very much activated. So we have lytic bone lesions that come as a result of osteoclastic activity uh, as a result of uh, the myeloma uh, invasion of the bone. So, um, so the net effect is what we call uh, an increase in bone resorption, which leads to ha us having hypercalcemia and also pathologic fractures. 
So if we, we might go to the clinical features, uh, we have bone pain being one of the major uh, symptoms. So in myeloma, we, we have said there's a proliferation of the tumor cells and release of interleukin-6, which will give us uh, a stimulation of the osteoclasts. So what they will do is to break down bone, which is going to give us the hypercalcemia we mentioned in CRAB, okay? So uh, on the right, you can see uh, we have uh, the typical, what you call uh, the punched out lesions of, on, of multiple myeloma. On the skull, you can see there are a number of them. There's this arrow pointing. Uh, the lytic lesions. Down here, we have a, a humerus that has been uh, fractured uh, as a result of the same. On the humerus, you can also see you ha we have a few lytic lesions. So that is a, a presentation that we, we usually see in myeloma. Another thing is as a result of uh, uh, the um, fracture of the bones, sometimes you might have a spinal cord compression. So if you have a fracture on, on the spine, we might have uh, vertebral fractures compressing on the spinal cord, giving us symptoms of uh, spinal cord compression, such as weakness, bladder incontinences, and, and, and all those things, paraplegias. So another very important thing is hypercalcemia, patients presenting with confusions and somnolence, symptoms of hypercalcemia, basically bone pain, constipation, nausea. Another very uh, critical point to understand is anemia. And uh, the characteristic of anemia in multiple myeloma is that it is nomocytic, nomochromic. So much so that anybody presenting with nomocytic and nomochromic anemia is actually a candidate for evaluation. And unexplained nomocytic and nomochromic anemia is a, a candidate for evaluation of multiple myeloma. So um, it results from the replacement of the normal bone marrow by infiltrating tumor, tumor cells and inhibition, inhibition sorry, of normal red cell production uh, by the cytokines. So it's quite a multifactorial uh, issue. Uh, another thing is bleeding. This comes from as a result of uh, thrombocytopenia. So the clotting factors, the function of the clotting factors are affected by um, the invasion in the blood by the plasma cells and, and, and uh, giving us what you call uh, thrombocytopenias. Another very important uh, presentation is what we call hyperviscosity syndrome. So this gives us issues such as uh, stroke, uh, myocardial ischemias and infarction. This is basically increase in uh, the volume of the monoclonal proteins. So that means the blood is going to be more viscous, okay? So the circulation of oxygen in the blood to the peripheral organs becomes uh, an issue. So we have a stroke, myocardial ischemia, and infection, among others. Um, another presentation is infection. So since we have, um, it's basically at a late stage or a severe invasion by the plasma cells, we have a decrease in almost all the cell lines. For the red blood cells, we have anemia. For um, the platelets, we are getting bleeding tendencies. For the white blood cells also, we are suppressing uh, the other white blood cells. Uh, this is uh, an invasion. Uh, so we will basically have an infection. The uh, white blood cells that are supposed to be protecting the body from these infections are suppressed. So we'll have a, a invasion by organisms and the common ones include uh, the pneumonia pathogens. So it's always important in our history to look for any signs of uh, any history of uh, recurrent uh, lower respiratory tract infections. And this comes as about as a result of what we call hypergamma globulinemia. So we are having a, a decrease in the production and an increase in, in the destruction of the normal antibodies. So that is actually going to also contribute to our infection. So another very important thing is renal failure. We said in CRAB, R is our renal failure. So it may develop acutely or chronically. It is uh, commonly due to the hypercalcemia. So um, there's a, there are a number of factors that uh, are uh, you know, said to contribute to this. One is this hypercalcemia. Another one is dehydration that comes with uh, the disease. Uh, another one is a tubular damage that comes uh, from excretion of the light chains, what you're calling the best genes proteins. So uh, other causes is uh, a very uh, common presentation is amyloid, amyloidosis and hyperuricemia that comes with uh, multiple myeloma. They might also contribute to the renal failure. And neurologic symptoms, it might come as a result of uh, three things. One, hypercalcemia, giving us confusion, weakness, and fatigue. Another one is a hyperviscosity syndrome, the headaches, the retinopathies, and those, all those things. Another very important uh, thing is what you call particular pain, which we are talking about, pathologic fractures of the vertebra, giving us cord compression and the rest. So on physical examination, some of the most common uh, presentations include 
uh, pala uh, as a result of an underlying anemia, ecchymosis and pipira because of the thrombocytopenia, bone pain without tenderness is also typical. So lytic destructive bone lesions or pathologic fractures uh, present as a bone pain without tenderness. Okay. So this is a diagram of an amyloid, uh, a macroglossia, uh, sorry, as a result of, uh, you know, amyloidosis. Amyloidosis is a very common uh, condition that is uh, associated with uh, multiple myeloma. So it might also be a presentation. So the shoulder pad sign is defined by bilateral swelling of uh, the shoulder joints secondary to amyloid deposition. So diagnosis, lab studies, complete blood count will show anemia, uh, thrombocytopenia, on leukopenia, it might show one, it might show uh, uh, two, or or actually uh, all of them. Peripheral blood smears will give us what we call a relux formation, and this as a result of the stickiness. The red blood cells actually, uh, they are able to stick uh, to each other as a result of the, you know, heavy invasion of the blood by the immunoglobulins, okay? High plasma proteins are able to uh, stick the red blood cells together. So under peripheral blood smear, they appear as a relic formation. So a 24-hour urine collection is very important for us to rule out a, a multiple myeloma. It is expected that we are going to see a base joint protein. We're also going to assess for the function, urea and the electrolytes and the creatinine. So um, Imaging studies are also very important in the diagnosis. Skeletal uh, surveys uh, with the X-ray, starting with the baseline, going to MRIs, and also PET CT scans. These are going to show us uh, lytic lesions uh, and also possible metastasis to the vertebra and far, far organs. So another very important thing is a procedure called the bone marrow aspirate and biopsy. This one is going to show us if indeed there are plasma cells. Uh, if first of all there are indeed plasma cells, and, and number two. Uh, at what level? Is it more than 10%? Is it more than 40%? Is it more than 30%? Which is very important also in the diagnostic criteria. For our patient, we said it's more than 40% plasma cytosis. This is the diagnostic criteria for multiple myeloma. We have a major criteria and minor criteria. The major criteria com uh, com is composed of marrow plasma cytosis of more than 10%, uh, serum M component of more than 35 grams per liter of IgA, or uh, 20 gram per liter of uh, uh, IgG, sorry, or more than 20, uh, 20 gram per liter of IgA. And also a uh, biopsy proven plasma cytoma. With those three, we are able to diagnose. If not, we, are, we need a minor criteria. Uh, we are able to pick maybe uh, it, it has part A and B. So for A, if you have less than 10% of uh, plasma cells in marrow uh, with monoclonal immunoglobulin expression, and uh, at least three minor uh, criteria from uh, part B. For example, uh, lytic bone lesions, depressed normal immunoglobulins, unexplained normochromic normocytic anemias, serum B2 microglobulin levels, unexplained renal dysfunction, and uh, unexplained hypercalcemia. So that is uh, the diagnostic criteria for multiple myeloma. Uh, the prognostication uh, for multiple myeloma initially uh, there was this jury salmon staging uh, for multiple myeloma. It was staging according to three stages. The first stage uh, were all the following. For example, hemoglobin of more than 10, gram per deciliter, serum uh, calcium of less than 2.6, and there is normal bone um, or solitary plasma cytoma. Again, uh, stage three was one or more of the following, hemoglobin of less than 8, serum calcium of uh, more than 3, advanced lytic lesions, uh, on X-ray, high comp uh, M component production. So more than IgG of more than uh, 70 gram per liter or IgG of more than 50 gram per liter and base just protein of more than 12, uh, 12 gram per 24 hour urine. So uh, stage two was anything between that, uh, between uh, stage one and uh, stage two, also known as intermediate. Today we have the revised uh, international staging system for multiple myeloma. Uh, this is the current one that is in use. So stage one, two, and three. Uh, stage one being a serum albumin more than 3.5 gram per deciliter, serum beta two microglobulin of less than the 3.5, uh, no high risk chromosomal abnormalities, normal serum LDH level. So serum, something of note is uh, microglobulin and also LDH level. Beta two microglobulin is uh, shared by the plasma cells as part of their cell cycle. So the more we have an increase in microglobulin, it tells us 
that we have actually more plasma cells in the blood. So it, it's one of the actually one of the mainstay uh, prognostication factors that are available today. So both uh, stage three being serum uh, beta two microglobulin more than five point five high risk chromosomal abnormalities. In this one, we are incorporating a uh, fish, uh, which is fluorescent immuno. Uh, what was fluorescent immuno? Okay, you'll remind me. I'm forgetting, but fish is a way to assess uh, the cytogenetic abnormalities of, uh, of, of the cells. So there, there are a few variants of myeloma. Uh, we've mentioned a few, and we are going to just mention very briefly, and then we, we go back to uh, our uh, typical myeloma, symptomatic myeloma. Monoclonal, uh, monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance is a variant. Smoldering or indolent myeloma is another. Solitary plasmocytoma of bone, non-secretory multiple myeloma, and POM syndrome. So monoclonal gammopathy, it's a pre-malignant, uh, what you call pre-malignant myeloma. Um, basically, people who have a monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, they have a benign uh, cause of what you call uh, lesser, uh, you know, they're not symptomatic, basically. Uh, for these particular patients, we are not uh, advised to have an active treatment for them. For them, it's more of a watch and wait, and also do uh, um, every three to six months. We are supposed to evaluate for lab results and also for um, skeletal surveys and all. Uh, small learning myeloma. Uh, it's also uh, asymptomatic when compared to, and when compared to uh, MGUS, it has a larger M protein in the blood and presence of more myeloma plasma cells. So uh, the levels of these markers are lower than those in active uh, multiple myeloma, however. So um, this one, it has a risk of progression to the symptomatic multiple myeloma. So after every five years, we have a 50% chance of patients progressing. So for these ones, we advise to do PET CT scans and MRI uh, to exclude presence of bone disease and also skeletal surveys. A solitary plasma cytoma of bone. This one is a solitary plasma cytoma. It affects only one bone. It's one tumor affecting one bone. So uh, the good thing about it, it responds very well to treatment and usually radiation or surgery is the choice. So uh, these uh, patients with solitary plasma cytoma, they have a higher risk for uh, developing uh, progress into multiple myeloma, so they have to be monitored closely with regular checkups. POM syndrome stands for polyneuropathy, organomegaly, uh, endocrinopathies, and M protein and skin changes, including hyperpigmentation, hypertrichosis, and many others, scleroderma like changes, and all. So, those are uh, the non uh, standard uh, presentations, but there are other common features that are uh, included, for example. Uh, edema, ascites, pleural effusion, osteosclerotic bone lesions. So, uh, um, POM syndrome is also a variant of multiple myeloma. So, um, an autologous peripheral blood stem transplantation for this particular case is the treatment of choice. In older patients, we use melphalan and dexamethasone. So, non secretory myeloma, we have no M proteins in the serum or in the urine uh, with immunofixation. However, a bone marrow clonal plasma cytosis of more than 10% or uh, plasma cytoma. There is no myeloma related uh, organ or tissue impairment for this particular case. So, since we have no M protein in the serum or urine, they call it a non secretory myeloma. So, management plan we divide it into active care and supportive care. Active care being chemotherapy, autologous or allogenic stem cell transplantation, uh, immunotherapies. Supportive care being uh, uh, radiotherapy, biphosphonate, and things like uh, kyphoplasty. So uh, as general supportive measures, we have uh, analgesics for relief of pain, high fluid intake of about uh, three liters per day to treat the renal impairment and hypercalcemia. Prompt treatment of infections with antibiotics, treatment of anemia uh, may require blood transfusion. Allopurinol is also might be needed to prevent hyperuricemia and uh, uric nephropathies. Hyperviscosity syndrome that we talked about is managed by plasma paresis. By phosphonates such as zolendronate and pamidronate to inhibit the osteoclastic activity. So uh, also very important is orthopedics uh, review. Um, multidisciplinary collaboration might also be needed for possible uh, surgical repair or decompression. Um, renal failure might, uh, can be treated by ad adequate rehydration and oral uh, prednisolone. A very important uh, um, 
point in the management is autologous stem cell transplantation uh, for young patients who are less than 65 years without renal failure. So for them, there's a the standard treatment is first line high dose uh, chemotherapy uh, for what you call myeloablation. We give uh, melphalan uh, 200 milligram uh, per meter squared intravenously to maximize the response, and then you do the autologous uh, stem cell transplantation. For chemotherapy, uh, we, we, we have a, a different uh, management plans for older patients and younger patients. For the older patients, thalidomide combined with an alkylating agent such as melphalan or cyclophosphamide or chlorambucil and prednisolone. Um, something uh, of note is thalidomide is teratogenic, but in the case of multiple myeloma, it has proven to be very effective and hence a uh, first line. So bortezomib is a... Um, it is an immunotherapy drug. It's a protease, proteasome inhibitor, which is used for uh, upfront and also relapse, uh, combined with doxorubicin and dexamethasone. Uh, lenalidomide in combination with steroid has also been tried. So for the younger patients who are less than 65 years, uh, bortezomib, cyclophosphamide, and dexamethasone are uh, the drugs of choice. And our patient is actually on the three, uh, bortezomib, cyclophosphamide, and dexamethasone. Orally active cyclophosphamide, thalidomide, and dexamethasone based induction, followed by a high dose uh, melphalan, is also an option. So, radiotherapy, uh, it's effective for local problems like severe bone pain and pathological fractures and tumorous lesions. As an also, it's also effective as an emergency treatment of what you call spinal cord compression, complicating uh, extradural, extradural plasma cytomas. So, we have plasma cytomas that uh, actually affect. Uh, the spinal cords. So it might give us spinal cord compression with symptoms of paraplegia, incontinence, uh, weakness, and you know, paraparesis and such. So it might be used as, a, as an emergency treatment. So those are my references. Thank you very much. Hello? Yes, uh, Dr. Suleyma or Dr. Fatma, kindly take over. Go ahead, Dr. Suleyman. Uh, thanks, Jamal, for the good presentation. It was quite detailed and succinct at the same time. Um, just a few points. So in our patient, there was uh, no M band, as you had mentioned. So just to remember that the, nowadays the M band is not part of the diagnostic criteria. Just go to your diagnostic criteria. Because it is only present in 80% of patients. So this kind, this uh, criteria has been revised. Uh, so currently, the criteria is having uh, plasma cytosis in the marrow of more than ten percent, with a, a myeloma defining event. So they are called myeloma defining events, which include the CRAB criteria, which you mentioned: hypercalcemia, renal failure, anemia, and uh, bone lesions. So if you have anything more than 10% and a myeloma-defining event, that's a diagnostic for multiple myeloma. The reason being is M component above 30 or 35 with plasma cytosis more than 10 can also be smoldering uh, multiple myeloma. And it only occurs in 80%. So there are 20% of patients who don't have M component. Um, and M component in our patient was absent, although we didn't do further testing, we didn't do immunofixation. For her, it was just an SPEP. So in such patients, you would need to do immunofixation as well to search for the M component and also to do uh, three light chains, which I believe she has been sent for. Uh, so this criteria has been revised. So that's one thing to note. Um, 
And in those 20% who don't have an M component, around 3% don't have it at all. So it's called, as you had mentioned earlier, non-secretory multiple myeloma, but that's a very small percentage. Uh, there's also something called a SLIM criteria. SLIM stands for S is a percentage in the marrow of more than 60. So S is 60. If it's more than 60%, that then by automatically that's multiple myeloma. Uh, LI in SLIM stands for light chains more than 100. So that also is automatically multiple myeloma. And uh, M is more than one for collision on MRI. So any of those three uh, biomarkers indicate multiple myeloma. So that's a revised criteria perhaps I can share with you. Uh, additionally, treatment depends now on cytogenetics. Nowadays, this FISH stands for uh, in situ hybridization. So it checks for cytogenetics to look at because there are those who cytogenetic changes which have a bad prognosis. So before giving treatment, ideally, you should do fish. And then once you pick up whether there's a high risk or a low risk cytogenetic, then you give your treatment. Uh, but in our setup, it's a bit difficult to get it done because of cost, implication, and all that. But uh, that's the uh, standard of care where you do your fish first before giving treatment because the prognosis differs depending on what you find in, in the fish results. Um, yeah, I think in terms of treatment, just go to your treatment slides. So, uh, Treatment can nowadays be divided either into triple therapy. First of all, you get your fish. From there, you, you now check, is the patient fit for stem cell transplant or not? If not, there's uh, treatment for those patients. If, if you intend to do stem cell transplant, you can induce with chemo, then do your transplant. Um, it's nowadays divided into either triple therapy or double therapy. So triple, let's go to the next slide. So triple therapy may include things like now bortezomib, cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone. So they have different kinds. The treatment is quite um, specific in de depending on your cytogenetics, depending on whether the patient will get a stem cell transplant, and also depending on the age of the patient and you know patient related factors and all that cost implication because bortezomib is not a cheap drug so a triple therapy includes a steroid which is dexamethasone then you can either give lenalidomide and bortezomib or you can give lenalidomide and uh, other monoclonal antibodies such as uh, daratumumab those are newer agents or you can do double therapy in patients who can't, for example, afford, let's say, bortezomib. So you can do lenalidomide and dexamethasone or cyclo and dexamethasone. Um, yeah, so it's, it varies from patient to patient. Um, so there's no one fixed regimen for everyone. And then remember, lastly, to treat complications. Uh, you treat your anemia, you treat your hypercalcemia, and uh, most of these patients, uh, at high risk of thrombosis, like in your patient, there's, uh, they've already developed a DUT. So prevention is key in terms of uh, thrombosis, but they had multiple risk factors, the fracture, immobilization, and all those. So you need to treat complications. And one of the main ones is the bone complications. So you can cover them with biphosphonates if there's any skeletal involvement. But that is dependent on your patient's renal function because you can't give biphosphonates in anyone with EGFR less than 60. So nowadays, there's a newer drug called denusumab, which is given to patients with an EGFR less than 60. But that's also expensive. It's a monoclonal antibody, and it's quite useful. It's an anti-CD38. So it's useful for patients with skeletal involvement in multiple 
uh, myeloma. That's what is used in the West or in, in those who can afford uh, the drug. So our patient would be optimal to get um, denusumab because they have bone involvement, i.e. the fracture and the osteolytic lesions, and their EGFR is definitely less than 60 given their high creatinine. So they fit perfectly for denusumab. However, denusumab is costly. I'm not sure how much, but it's not anything less than 50 or 100K. Uh, and it's given four weekly. So you can imagine that's every four weeks. Um, but yeah, that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, I think that's all I have to add. In terms of for fifth year, sixth years, I mean, you've done a, a good job in presenting the case, the history and the topic. So, so well done, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Dakari. So any questions, clarifications, uh, we are happy to answer. I think it will be faster to unmute and ask rather than type. I guess it was clear enough, Amma. Either it was clear or uh, nothing was understood. <laughs> I, I uh, think no, no, the no, former. The yeah. was good. <clears throat> uh, I don't see any questions or, or um, contribution in the chat box. I think we can invite Dr. Fatma to. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, first of all, let me say I'm honored to have uh, um, been invited to uh, participate in this uh, uh, CME, uh, um, or rather the grand round. Um, I think um, you're doing an excellent uh, job um to do these uh, sessions uh, because then they become revision sessions revision sessions for all of you and also opportunity to ask questions because sometimes uh, many of you uh, during class even when you are given an opportunity to ask question many of you shy away from asking so at least here you can hide behind the screen and type your question in the chat box and you should feel free to do that mm. So um, well done, continue with this. Uh, coming back to the presentation, um, Hamad Jamal, uh, that was excellent. It was very extensive. You covered everything, um, except for the few additions that uh, uh, Suleiman did. Mm, but I think you are also rushing. And so some of the information you did have on your slide but um, you are rushing because you are conscious of the time, because of the hitches that we had at the beginning, um, starting um, this uh, session. Um, and that, that was good. Um, uh, Suleiman, thanks for the uh, update. Yes, th those are the updates. Uh, you've also done an excellent job of pointing out um, certain important things and the changes. Um, what I think is important and that I want to bring out is that medicine is not static. It's ever-changing, of course, ever-changing towards improvement. So um, that's why some of the criteria were, were revised. And then, and then when it comes to treatment, even the, 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 the choice of which drug to choose or which uh, combinations to choose. All this has also gone through a lot of revisions. Um, so you need to keep up um, uh, so that um, your patients get the best benefit. Um, so that's very good. Um, and that's why um, attending such uh, sessions um, 
and or reading uh, latest articles on, on, on specific topics like this gives you that extra uh, information. Mm, especially at the postgraduate level, that the uh, that becomes very very uh, important. Uh, at, well, for the undergraduate, I think the basics um, uh, are enough um, because there's so much information. You can see Muhammad Jamal had so many slides, and the slides had so much information in them. Uh, you, um, what is important is for you to 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 divide and have a, like a table. What are the important? What must knows that you need to know about multiple myeloma, okay, that you can't avoid as an undergraduate. Um, and then once you've gotten and grasped those ones, then now you can move to the next column of um, uh, what is good to know. Mm, and if you've grasped those, then you can go to the nice to know. But at uh, undergraduate level, I think, um, one, if you have grasped the must knows, then you you're fine. You 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 make it through, and um, unless you are proving to be a distinction student, then maybe now you may be asked about the the others good to knows and nice to knows, so that um, the whoever is asking you the question can feel you deserve that distinction. Mm. So. Um, for the case, I think the only thing I'd want to point out is that many times in the Department of Hematology, when we are looking at the bone marrows of such patients, sometimes it's not easy to get that um, percent, the high percentage of plasma cells uh, that is used in the criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Because of two things. As Muhammad Jamal said, it's multiple myeloma. It's not a smooth um, and continuous um, involvement of the bone marrow. So depending on where you did your aspirate, you may pick up right in the middle of the, the, the clonus, and therefore you will get very good percentages, um, very high percentages. But many times that doesn't happen, especially in patients who are presenting early, um, because it actually appears in patches in the bone marrow. Unless you were to actually do the bone marrow under ultrasound guidance and go for the lytic lesions, uh, um, then uh, you, you are likely to get the very high percentages of plasma cells. But if you're just doing a normal bone marrow and you're doing for an adult, maybe you've just gone to the manubrium sternum, and you're doing it, you, you may or may not. So many times when we look at these bone marrows, we don't just look at the numbers of plasma cells and percentage, but we actually look at the morphology of those plasma cells. Because when you don't have the numbers and you look at the morphology and they look abnormal, and there are several criteria of uh, what abnormal plasma cells look like, then and then there's the um, uh, corroborating, corroborating history or clinical features um, that are suggestive of the myeloma. And then we see that in the marrow, abnormal plasma cells that may even be less, much less than uh, 10%. But at least 10% usually we're able to see. But critically in those less than 10%, then we spend a lot of time looking at the morphology of those plasma cells and the typical features of plasma cells you don't see, okay? Um, so what are the typical features of plasma cells? Um, Ahmad Jamal had them in, the, uh, in his slides, but he rushed through them because of time. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you can remember quickly. Um, anybody would like to say them? Anybody remembers? No, is that a tough question? All right, I'm sorry. So let me give them to you. So usually a normal um, plasma cell has an eccentric nucleus. 
What do we mean by that? We mean that the nucleus is pushed to one side of the cytoplasm so that you see it looking like it's close to the cell membrane on one side. And then on the other side, there's a more, a much more abundant cytoplasm. So that feature and eccentricity, eccentric nucleus. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can put the picture. You had a very nice picture of plasma cells. Do, 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 the, do that, uh, please, Muhammad. Um, so that's one feature. The second feature is that when you look at the um, nucleus, yes, very good. Yeah, that's a good one. When you look at the nucleus of the plasma cells and you look at it very keenly, especially at high power, around the nuclear membrane, you will see like a clock, uh, like a clock, uh, um, an impression of a clock. Um, uh, what do you mean? I mean, you know what a clock is. Usually it will have the digits one, two, three, up to 12. So in the plasma cell, you see like concentrated uh, nuclear material at one o'clock, at uh, two o'clock, like that all around the edge uh, of, the, um, of the nucleus. Uh, so that's uh, described as clock face uh, appearance. That's what a, um, a normal plasma cell looks like. And then the third feature, it is in this, um, maybe the clock face isn't so clear in this one because the power um, magnification is low. But can you see in the uh, um, side where there's extra, uh, there's abundant cytoplasm, there is like a clearing in the middle. It, you know, the cytoplasm is not smoothly of uncolor, but there's like a clearing there and it's there in this slide. So those are the three typical features of a normal um, um, uh, plasma cell. So when now we suspect this must be multiple myeloma, but they're not, the plasma cells are not increased, you know, they're just borderline uh, and maybe, you know, the age of the patient. And mm, sometimes we've had that difficulty, the younger patients like 40 year olds uh, with myeloma, um, marrows that are suggestive of multiple myeloma. So we look at for we look for those plasma cells in the marrow and look for these three features. If these three features are missing, then we we will say um, plasma cells are dysplastic and suggestive of something else that also helps us when we've seen these dysplastic single plasma cells. We spend a lot of time looking around in the marrow, and many times when you do, you are rewarded you'll find multinucleated um, uh, plasma cells. Plasma cell with either two or three or even four nuclei within one cytoplasmic uh, membrane. So that's another feature that we look for that helps us and to convince us, yes, these are definitely dysplastic and these are definitely abnormal plasma cells. And then we feel comfortable to say, uh, this, that this is suggestive of multiple myeloma. What are the skeletal features? What are the um, renal features and other clinical features? You know, we do that a lot in the lab because many times when you send requests to the lab, you give very scanty information. M many of you will say query, patient with anemia, query multiple myeloma, and that's it. And sometimes when you look at the age, you've not even given us an exact age, you've just written A for adult. So sometimes you're actually forced to call the ward and ask for extra information um, so that, um, because as you've seen, multiple myeloma requires both a minor, cri a minor criteria, presence of minor criteria, as well as major criteria, at least if it's possible. So that's why we need this clinical information um, uh, in the lab when you're looking at the marrow so that then now we say, yes, this is in keeping with multiple myeloma. But if you don't give us the uh, clinical information, then we'll just say, um, this is a plasma cytoma, um, rule out multiple myeloma uh, by doing skeletal surveys, lab, lab tests, uh, and renal function tests. 
and then we throw the ball back to you. Mm. So um, that's the only addition I wanted to put. So sometimes if you read those marrows, you might see that. Uh, if you read out the detail, don't just read the conclusion or the diagnosis, but read the description because we must describe. We will put it there, you know? Um, plasma cells look this plastic uh, and with some binucleate um, or trinucleate forms, though they are scattered and less than 10%. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the only addition I wanted to give from my side because everything else was very well covered uh, by both Ahmed Jamal and Sliman. Well done, the two of you. You've done an excellent job. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fatma and Dr. Suleiman, for your valuable information and contribution to this wonderful discussion today. I believe we have picked uh, so much uh, from, from our discussion today, and uh, we both thank you so much. And also to our presenter, Jamal, uh, we thank you so much for taking your time and effort to prepare these slides and present this wonderful presentation. Uh, to our audience, if anyone still has a, a comment or needs any clarification, kindly uh, type in in the chat box. Okay, there's no, there's nothing in the chat box. So I conclude that uh, the topic was clear and uh, I believe everybody has picked up many things. Thank you so much uh, for today's stand up. Uh, thank you as well, Dr. Um, Jamal and Dr. Fatma, thank you too. I believe we can uh, wind up our discussion here. You are most welcome. Mm -hmm. I was happy to mm -hmm. participate. We are more than happy to have you, Dr. Fatima. We were more than happy. Shukran, Jazakallah khair. Oh, yeah. Shukran. Jamal, stop recording.